Years ago, I, I had the opportunity to share the gospel with a man who was, who was uh, recovering from a drug addiction. And he was going through the uh, AA's 12-step program, and, and in the process of going through that, he came to the realization that he definitely needed God in his life. And so as we talked, he really liked the part about the unconditional love of Jesus Christ, but he really didn't like so much the part that Jesus was going to judge those people who rejected his gracious offer of salvation. And he was kind of thinking, Jesus, you know, judge anybody? No, no, no. God, he's much too loving. He's too nice to do. Jesus is a God of love. He's not a God of wrath. Well, unfortunately, that man had only a limited understanding of God. He didn't, didn't have a complete understanding of, of the true nature of Jesus Christ. And the truth is, yes, of course, Jesus in his pure grace and love and mercy, you know, died on the cross to pay for our sins. And yes, he offers to every one of us the free gift of salvation to anybody who by faith accepts him into their life. But it is so important. It is so important for us to understand that it is equally true that Jesus, being perfectly just and 100% perfectly righteous, he will one day pour out his righteous wrath and severely judge those people who just absolutely insist on rebelling against God and rejecting him as their Savior. So this morning... As we prepare to dive into Revelation 6, and as we look at this uh, incredible judgment that Jesus is going to have to pour out on all the, the, this wicked and rebellious world in the end times, it's important for us to ask and answer this question and to talk about why does the Lamb of God pour out his wrath? Now, we usually have a problem thinking about Jesus having wrath, right? Because when we ourselves, you know, when we have wrath, 99.999% of the time, it's not a good thing. It's just not a good thing. And so we usually associate wrath with being something bad. We associate it wrath with like completely losing your temper terribly or just flying off the handle or, you know, just having road rage and screaming at somebody about to run somebody off the road or losing control some way or doing something really foolish in our wrath and anger that you later deeply, deeply regret. That's what we usually think about wrath. But listen. Jesus' wrath is not at all like that. Because the wrath of Jesus, when it has to come, it is always completely in control. His wrath is always very purposeful, and it's always the perfect right response to sin and evil. You see, we need to understand that the righteous wrath of Jesus is a necessary part of his holiness. A necessary part. The wrath of Jesus reveals two things, his holy love for all that is good, and the wrath of Jesus re reveals his holy hatred for all that is evil. His holy love for all that's good, his holy hatred of all that is evil. In an article on wrath, uh, the wrath of God, uh, one scholar writes this in Baker's Dictionary of Theology. He says, in the total biblical portrayal, the wrath of God is not so much an emotion or an angry frame of mind as it is the settled opposition of his holiness to evil. So it's under, un, important also to understand, we're talking about the wrath of the Lamb, the wrath of God, is that although God's wrath is necessary, he does not enjoy pouring it out on man. And that's really important to understand. Now, it's important for us to understand that God is not saying, Oh, man, this is great. I just can't wait. I'm so excited about wiping out all these sinners. No, 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 no. That is not it at all. His wrath is the necessary response of a holy God to sin and evil, but it is not at all anything that he enjoys doing. In Ezekiel 33, 11, we read, Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death 
of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? See, God very much wants wicked, rebellious people. He wants us to turn around and come back. He, he doesn't want us to have to ever face his righteous wrath. Second Peter, uh, Peter tells us, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you. Listen to this. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's his heart. That's what God wants. He wants to save people. And that is why, as we said during communion, that's why he sent his son Jesus to us. And, and one more, as the Apostle Paul writes to his disciple Timothy, he says, This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And so, this morning then, as we continue our study of the book of Revelation, we are going to have a sobering, sobering look at the terrifying wrath of the Lamb of God as he righteously judges wickedness and evil in this period of time in the eschatological, eschatological scheme of things, the Great Tribulation. So, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 6. And uh, while you're finding that, let me just review what happened last week from chapter 5. There we saw Jesus in the throne room of God, and, and he, he walks up, and he comes to the Father, and he takes this scroll that has seven seals out of his hand. And this, this uh, uh, scroll shows, and as him taking it shows that Jesus alone is the one person in the universe who's worthy to take that seal, uh, that scroll, and open the seals. The scroll, as we recall, represents the inheritance, the, the title deed of the earth. And we talked about how the earth had been graciously given to Adam and to Eve and their descendants. But when Adam sinned, when he rebelled against God and God went on his own way, he forfeited his inheritance from God. And Satan, the great usurper, then gained possession and influence in this world. Jesus then... He, he, the kinsman redeemer, he's, will, he's worthy to redeem the earth and to cast Satan out and restore it back again. Why? Because on that cross, he paid the full price for all of our sins, Adam and Eve's sins and all of our sins. Now, chapter 6, we are going to see the breaking of the seals of judgment. We saw those seven seals this morning. We're going to see Jesus opening or breaking, breaking the first six one uh, of those seals up. So, uh, these seals are the, the actual revelation of all that goes on within those seals. It's given in greater detail in Revelation chapter 7 all the way to 19. This is kind of almost an overview of what's going to be happening during the tribulation. And it's going to culminate that seven-year period in the battle of Armageddon. And the Armageddon battle will only be concluded by the glorious second coming of Jesus Christ. And at that time, Satan's going to be cast out and bound. Jesus is going to be set, setting up his millennial kingdom on earth. Now, this period of judgment, Revelation 6, 19, is called the Great Tribulation. This is the time that when Jesus, in Matthew 24, uh, saying the very similar things in Matthew 24 and Revelation 6, he's saying this is the time that Jesus says, if he didn't return to end the tribulation, there wouldn't be anyone left alive. Sobering, serious time. Now, this chart shows how the judgments in Revelation 6 to 19 unfold. And as you can see there at the top, the, there are seven seals, you know, on that, that scroll, on um, the title deed. And each seal represents a different judgment, you know, that God is going to pour out in, in increments on, on earth. Now, if you look at the seventh seal, it's kind of leaned over, I mean, uh, and, but, well, the seventh seal, it kind of extended there because the seventh seal opens up to the seven trumpet judgments, okay? And then the seventh trumpet judgment uh, leads to the seven bowls of wrath. Now, from Daniel chapter 9, we're told that the length of the time of this tribulation period is seven years. And as we've seen, the church is going to be raptured before the tribulation. There are different theories and ideas about that, but our understanding is that the church is going to be raptured before the tribulation uh, begins. 
Again, we, we look at Revelation 3.10 where Jesus says, I will also keep you from the hour, the time period, this, this tribulation time he's talking about, of trial that's going to come upon the whole world, the whole world, to test those who live and breathe. And talking about the reputation of the Thessalonian believers, Paul's kind of bragging about them, saying, hey, this is what I hear uh, about you from other, other churches. He says, they, the other churches, tell how you Thessalonians turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Now, Paul describes exactly what will happen at the rapture. Uh, the, the best passage is 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18. Also talks about it in 1 Corinthians 15. But here in this passage, he says, For the Lord himself, Jesus, will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Those people who already died. And after that, who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. And let me tell you, that is very encouraging to see that we will be delivered from the great tribulation. When we, you hear about what's that tribulation, you're going to be real glad that you will have nothing to do with that. So, to sum up, Jesus came to earth, you know, look at a little chart again. He died on the cross, he rose three days later, and then began what is the church age. That's the age that we're in right now. And that church age is going to be ended by the rapture when Jesus takes the church, the specific uh, people of God in this church age, back to heaven. Then begins the seven period, seven years of the great tribulation, which is going to end with the second coming of Christ. And he will defeat Satan and his cohorts and then establish his millennial kingdom on earth. So, with that, everybody confused? I hope it was clear as clear as clear. With that background, the first four seals are the four horses of the apocalypse. Probably if you didn't know one thing about Revelation, you've heard of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But, so, uh, we got a little picture there of them. And uh, uh, this is not an inspired picture, but hopefully kind of helps you kind of envision something. Uh, of it. Beginning in verses 1 and 2, John says, I watched, and again, he's, he's still in the throne room of heaven, okay? I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. And then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice of thunder, Come. And I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Okay, Jesus breaks this first seal, and someone comes riding out on a white horse, and he just charges off, uh, we expect to conquer the earth. Now, some people, it's easy to get this confused because they think that this is uh, applying to Jesus because, you know, Revelations 19, 11, when Jesus does return to earth, you know, he, he's riding a white horse, and he has a crown on his head as well. But I think it's really clear that that's not at all the case because, for one thing, Jesus is the one who's breaking the seals. He's not one of the four, four horsemen. And also, chapter 6 to 19, it's a chronological unfolding of the tribulation. And this scene is at the very beginning of the tribulation where Jesus comes at the very end. So, who then is the rider on the white horse? Well, when we kind of put all the puzzle pieces together, you know, from the prophecy uh, through, the, through the scriptures, uh, specifically when you look at Matthew 24 and the Olivet Discourse, what Jesus had to say about it, uh, Revelation, of course, and you look at 2 Thessalonians and you look at the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament, it becomes apparent that this must be the Antichrist himself. Well, who is the Antichrist He's the person who's going to arise during this seven-year tribulation period, and he's going to fool the world into thinking that he is the Savior instead of Jesus. And he's going to be personally indwelt by Satan, indwelt, empowered, you know, by him, and he's going to have such spiritual magnetism that the whole world will actually bow down and worship him. 
Much more is going to be revealed about the Antichrist when we get to chapters 13 and 17 and 18. But for now, Revelation 6-2 describes his initial activities during the relatively calm first half of the tribulation period. Now, the fact that this horse is white, you know, symbolizes conquest and victory. He's going to have some victories. And he's wearing a crown, a Stephanos crown, which symbolizes rulership of the world. And that that word Stephanos, you know, indicates that he's won some kind of a a victory to be able to rule like this. So, the word for the crown that that Jesus uses, by the way, or the used to describe the crown on Jesus' head in Revelation 19, is diadem, a whole different crown. That is a crown which a king wears. Now, notice, too, that he has a bow. You know, he's carrying a bow. I think the picture had, a, had, a, had the white guy on the, the white horse having a bow. That indicates military power. And yet, it is a bow without arrows. And we don't know this for sure, but it may signify, as a bow with no arrows, it may well represent the initial conquest without open warfare. Initial conquest without open warfare breaking out. You see, the Antichrist doesn't reveal his true colors when he first appears on the scene. You know, uh, Paul warns in in 2 Corinthians, you know, that beware of Satan as as an angel of light. He can fool people. He can deceive people. He can look like a good guy. This is what he's going to do. He's going to have the disguise of an amazing peacemaker. And he's going to be able to literally take over the world as the great man of peace, as the liberator, the guy who's finally going to be able to bring peace to the Middle East. And this guy, this Antichrist, is going to deceive people into thinking that he has the answers to all the world's problems. And really, it's not until the second seal is broken that this pseudo-peace comes to an end. You know, there are a lot of indications that the tribulation could be soon, particularly the fact that in 1948, Israel became a nation. None of the the prophetic timetable could really make much progress before that happened. It could be, and, 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 you know, the rapture's before the tribulation, but it's right after it. And so it could be that the Antichrist just might be alive right now somewhere in the world. Paul tells us there there is someone who is holding back or preventing the rise of the Antichrist and that the Antichrist will not be able to come to power until that someone is, quote, taken out of the way. Well, who is that someone? Well, one commentator uh, says this. I think he says it well. The Holy Spirit of God is the only person with sufficient supernatural power to do this restraining. How does he do it? How does he hold back the lawless one, the Antichrist, back? Through Christians whom he indwells and through whom he works in society to hold back the swelling tide of lawless living. How will he be taken out of the way? When the church leaves the earth in the rapture, the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the way in the sense that his unique lawlessness restraining ministry through God's people will be removed. Now, you think the world is kind of bad off now? Think how bad it will be when all Christians remove, people, everyone who has a moral compass, everyone who, who believes in Christ, and we are making a difference in this world. We're salt and light, keeping it where it's at. When the church is gone, man, there's not going to be anything to hold back the lawlessness and the, the, you know, Satan being able to come to power. So, Anyway, so once the church, all true believers in Jesus Christ are raptured, Paul says, quote, the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed. The one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders. All right. The second seal is broken in verses 3 and 4 where we read, When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! Come! And then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. So the second seal is a red horse, and this red horse is a symbol for war. Because at this time, war, a worldwide kind of war, breaks out on earth. 
And with this war, no efforts of uh, the United Nations, no efforts of the United States or anyone else is going to be able to stop this war from coming. And that red color of the horse probably represents the tremendous bloodshed which, is, which this huge war is going to cause. Third and fourth seals reveal the terrible aftermath. I mean, the horrible, horrific results of this unprecedented war on earth. And so in verses 5 and 6, you know, the third seal is broken, and we read, When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come! And I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages and three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Okay, the third seal then is a black horse. And the color black is associated uh, in the book of Lamentations with famine. So famine, really, when you think about it, it's a very logical consequence uh, of worldwide war as food supplies are are totally destroyed and as people who are involved in, in, in creating food production, they are killed. And so Jesus also predicted this, this, this famine in Matthew 24, 7. He says, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom in this big war. In various places there will be famines and earthquakes. Now notice he's carrying a, a pair of scales. You know, again, they're not actually going to be four horsemen riding out. These, this is a symbol, symbolic representation of these things. So the fact that he's carrying a pair of scales is, is signifying that there's going to be a, a huge, severe shortage of food since food is going to be weighed out as carefully as gold is. Verse 6, a quart of wheat for a day's wages and three quarts of barley for a day's wages. What's that talking about? Well, a quart of wheat is the amount of wheat which would feed one person for one day. Barley was, was an, uh, animal, uh, food for animals, as Jacob could tell us. And that's what they feed, you know, their, their, their horses and things. But, and that's less expensive. Um, so what this is saying is that an entire day's wages could only buy enough food for one person for one day. In other words, in the tribulation period, a loaf of bread is going to cost what an average person makes in an entire day. Let's say that you make $20 an hour, and let's say you work eight hours a day. So that's $160 that you would earn, you know, during that day. So a loaf of bread, then, it's saying would cost $160, leaving you with no money to pay for anything else. And what if it wasn't just you? What if you had a wife and children to feed with that one loaf of bread. Close on the heels of the second and the third horseman is rider number four. In verses 7 and 8, we read, When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beast of the earth. The fourth seal, then, is a pale horse. And actually, that that word for pale in the original language is chloros, from which we get chlorophyll or Clorox or chlorine. And so it's kind of referring to a sicky, you know, pale yellow-green kind of color, kind of the color uh, of of death. So this horseman represents death. Death claims uh, the body, and Hades claims the soul uh, of people during this time. Now, this horse of death, oh, guys, it just staggers the imagination. Now, just stop and think about this for a minute. The current population of our world, I know because I asked Siri, and she told me, okay? <laughs> the population of the world at this time is 7.13 billion people. One-fourth of, of 7.13 billion people is 1.7 billion people that will die. 1.7 billion is the combined population of China and the United States of America. That many people will be dying. 
And so the massive toll of death, it's gonna, we're told it's going to come from the sword. You know, that's a representation for, for weaponry, maybe weapons of mass destruction. We don't know exactly, but whatever it is, it's, it's, it's going to kill a lot of people. Famine, we've talked about the plagues, wild beasts. We, we kind of don't think about plagues too much. You know, eh, it's no big deal. We've got medicines and all. And, but, but, you know, think back uh, in 1348 in Europe. The Black Plague, the Rebonic Plague came. It killed one-third of the population of Europe. That's 25 million people died then. Much more recently, do you know, I and mean, people just kind of forget this, but it is true, it's a fact. 1918, 30 million people worldwide died of the flu, of the flu. He said, well, you know, that can never happen today. we got medicines, and that can take care of all that stuff. Maybe. But we got to understand that today, you know, scientists are more and more becoming very concerned about the rise of these super bacteria that are proving to be resistant to almost all antibiotics. That, that could spell trouble. And then, of course, there's the distinct possibility of bacteriological warfare, which could be used to wipe out millions of people. And then we come to the last two seals. And the last two seals for this morning, with the fifth seal, the scene momentarily shifts from earth back up into heaven as we look at the fifth seal, tribulation martyrs. These are found in verses 9 to 11. John tells us, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? And then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be be killed as they had, had been completed. Now, okay, what, what believers are going to be killed? If all the believers were, were removed at the rapture, then, you know, who, who's going to die here? Well, we're told in Revelation that 144,000 Jewish people are going to become Christians. They're going to become believers in Christ. I don't know if they look at the, see all these people are gone, and, and they look at the prophecies, and they say, well, Jesus really was the Son of God. He really is God in the flesh. He is the Messiah. So these 144,000 Jews, man, they are going to tear up the world sharing Christ with everybody, with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, and many of them will come to faith during that time. But many of these new believers will die as martyrs. According to chapter 13, we are told that all who will not fall and worship the Antichrist will be put to death. So, these tribulation martyrs, then, are seen under the altar. These are people, martyrs, who've been killed, and now they're up in heaven. They're seen under an altar, and that's indicating that they sacrificed their lives to remain faithful and true to Jesus Christ. Finally, we come to the sixth seal, which is a mega earthquake. Verse 12, I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of of goat hair, and the whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Now, this is a sobering scene. I mean, this is just kind of strikes fear and wonder and awe when you read about this. It's talking about this earthquake. And the word for earthquake is seismos, from which we get the word seismograph, an instrument to to measure the intensity of earthquakes. But this is no ordinary earthquake. It is a seismos megas, a great earthquake earthquake, an earthquake that is so big and so destructive that no Richter scale ever invented will be able to even come close to measuring its force and its intensity. And this, guys, I mean all of this, but this is kind of building and building, and this is God just unleashing his righteous judgment on a world that has completely rejected him. It literally shakes its fist at God and is blaspheming his name. 
The sun turning black could uh, easily be a solar eclipse. The moon uh, could appear red from heavy atmospheric debris, which could be the result of volcanoes erupting, which when you have large earthquakes, a lot of times uh, volcanoes go off, and could possibly be the debris, the uh, aftermath of nuclear explosions. We just don't really know. But the stars in the sky falling to earth will probably be some huge, massive meteor shower because we know that when meteors come into the earth's atmosphere, they turn this fiery red color. Now listen to this. Verse 14 says, The sky receded like a scroll rolling up. Not really sure what that means, but listen to what one commentator uh, thinks. Do you know what happens in a nuclear explosion? The atmosphere rolls back on itself. It is this tremendous rush of the air back into the vacuum that causes much of the destruction of a nuclear explosion. John's words in this verse may well be describing an all-out nuclear exchange. Who knows? Maybe so. Maybe that was what John is trying to describe in his first century vocabulary and his first century understanding of what he was seeing. And listen to this. Every mountain and island was removed from its place. Every mountain, every island removed from its place. Can you imagine the amount of power it would take to, to move Mount Everest, to move the Himalayas, to re- remove the Rocky Mountains from their place? This, guys, this is the mother of all earthquakes, and it's combined with an all-out war. And such massive global destruction, it's just hard for us to wrap our minds around. It's hard to even imagine. And no wonder, no wonder Jesus, when he's describing this great tribulation period, the same thing in Matthew chapter 24, 21 and 22, he says this, For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. So, What is man's response going to be to these unprecedented, catastrophic events? Well, verse 16 indicates that they will somehow know and recognize that all of this, they're finally going to see that this is God's wrath. It's the wrath of the Lamb that's causing all of this. And, 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 uh, And I wonder if that this is another possible explanation of this sky receding like a scroll rolled up. I wonder, I wonder if this is talking about God just suddenly opening up the sky and allowing these rebellious men and wicked men to look up and to be able to see the throne of heaven and see God on his throne and the Lamb and catch a glimpse about that because somehow, somehow they knew. They knew that all of this catastrophe was the pouring out of God's wrath on them. So how do they respond? Do they finally fall down before the Lamb and seek his mercy and grace and worship him as the God of the universe? Let's see their response. Verses 15 to 17, we read, Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man, that's pretty much everybody, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. And who can stand? And the answer is nobody. But did you hear the response? In spite of all that has happened, men still refuse to submit and turn to God. Instead, man's response is to run and hide. Run and hide. And what a picture that is. What an incredible picture that is. A rebellious, arrogantly stubborn, blasphemous man. Instead of praying to God to save them, who are they praying to? Mountains and rocks to fall on them and hide them from God. They want nothing to do with God. Nothing. And that's the way it has been from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Think about it. The very first thing that Adam and Eve did when they rebelled and sinned against God was what? Run and hide. Run and hide. And so it continues to the end of the world where men would rather hide from God in fear than run to him in faith. Well, how about us? 
How are we? That's how they responded in the tribulation time. How are we to respond to this revelation of the coming wrath of the Lamb? Well, listen, I've got several. But the first one I think is so important. Our first response, the very first thing is to humbly. Guys, this should bring us to our knees, okay? But to humbly thank Jesus for his willingness, listen to this, to endure on the cross the full, terrifying force of God's righteous and just wrath against our sins. That's a mouthful. Let me repeat it again. Humbly thank Jesus for his willingness to endure on the cross the full, terrifying force of God's righteous and just wrath against our sins. Now, this chapter of Revelation, guys, it's a picture of, to us of what it's like to experience the terrifying wrath of God. God's wrath is the necessary response of a perfectly holy and just God to sin. But God is not only a God of wrath. He's also a God of love. Thank God he is. He loves us. He doesn't want any of us to have to experience his righteous wrath. So God's own heart provided a solution. God's own heart, out of his own heart, came a way of salvation for you and for me. You see, our sins have to be paid for. They just have to be. That's the only just thing is for sins to be paid for. And so Jesus stepped up to the plate and said to his father, I'll pay for their sins. I'll I'll pay for them. And so to the cross he went. And Jesus on that cross experienced the full, terrible, horrifying, furious force of God's holy wrath against our sins. 1 John 4.10 says, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Romans 3.5, Paul describes Jesus as the one whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Propitiation, there's a word you don't hear too often. What in the world is propitiation? Let me tell you, it is an awesome word, okay? Hey, we don't hear it too much, and a lot of times it's translated, you know, atonement for sin, but that's close, that's good. But the New American Standard, man, I think they got it right. Those translators have it right because they, because propitiation, hilasterion in the Greek, means the turning away of wrath by an offering. The turning away of wrath by an offering. Oh, guys, this is so beautiful. This is just, this is unbelievable because Jesus averted the terrifying wrath of God away from us and on to himself. And let me tell you, the physical pain which Jesus experienced on the cross, that was nothing. That was terrible. It was nothing compared to the excruciating agony of Jesus having to endure God's wrath against all of the collective sins of mankind. It literally killed him. For the one and only time in all of eternity, God turned his back on his son Jesus and poured out his wrath on him instead of on us. Max Lucado attempts to put into words this what it was like for God to abandon his son Jesus on the cross. And he writes this. Here's the cup, my son. Drink it alone. God must have wept as he performed his task. Every lie, every lure, every act done in shadows was in that cup. Slowly, hideously, they were absorbed into the body of the Son. The final act of incarnation, the spotless lamb, was blemished. The king turns away from his prince. The undiluted wrath of a sin-hating father falls upon his sin-filled son. The fire envelops him. The shadows hide him. The son looks for his father, but the father cannot be seen. My God, my God, why? It was the most gut-wrenching cry of loneliness in history, and it came not from a prisoner or a widow or a patient. It came from a hill, from a cross, from a Messiah. My God, my God, he screamed, why did you abandon me? 
Never have words carried such hurt. Never has one being been so lonely. The despair is darker than the sky. The two who have been one are now two. Boy, our first response should be to thank Jesus for loving us so much that he was willing to actually experience the wrath of God so that we would not have to. Second right response to Revelation 6 is to accept Christ as your Savior so you won't have to face Him as your judge. Accept Him as your Savior so you won't have to face Him as your judge one day. It's one or the other. No middle ground here. Right now, you and I, we are blessed to be living in the age of grace. And right now, you can just picture Jesus extending his hand to you and to me. And he wants to have a relationship with you. And he wants for you to be in his family. And he wants just to pour out his love on you. His hand is extended right now to you. But it won't be extended forever. Because there's coming a time when God will put his hand down. And if you keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off until one day you unexpectedly die, then it will be too late. It'll be too late then. Then you will have to experience his wrath instead of his love forever. The most important decision you will ever make in your lifetime is whether or not you choose to accept Jesus into your life for the full forgiveness of your sins. You know, a lot of times we hear the expression, you become a Christian, you get saved, okay? And we kind of hear that a lot. What do we get saved from? His wrath. His wrath. That's a big deal. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you're already a Christ follower, the next two are for you. And that's this, to live holy and godly lives in this world. In his second letter, uh, Peter is talking about the last days, and he essentially says this. He says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? He's talking to Christians. He said, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. Church, listen, hearing about the terrifying wrath of God that's coming on this world, that's a wake-up call for us, guys. It's a sobering reminder of what really is important and what is not. It's a wake-up call for us all to live our lives in a way that pleases our Savior. Maybe there's something you need to start doing that God's calling you to do. Maybe there's something that you need to stop doing that God, because we're living, he could come back any minute. In light of this, we need to live holy, godly lives. And then finally, the fourth response uh, is to share the gospel of grace with those around you who do not have a personal relationship with Christ. Let me ask you, do you have some friends, do you have some family members, some neighbors, some people at work that, that do you know and you care about that do not have a personal relationship with Christ? I want you to think of one of those people right now and just kind of have a visual image of them. Picture that. Picture one lost person that you care about. Picture that person. You got them in your mind? You thinking of that person? Everybody got somebody? Do you want them to suffer God's wrath for eternity? Do you want them to spend eternity suffering for their sins? Or do you want them to join you in church? Do you want them to join you in heaven one day and enjoy God's love forever? Listen, you may be the person. You may be the person that God wants to use to tell your friend, to tell that person how they can begin a relationship with God. You're not responsible for how they respond, but we are responsible to share it, to tell them, to share the gospel of grace. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you for this uh, sobering look that you've given us of what this world is coming to. 
And Father, we just thank you that as we look at, at just how just unbelievable your, your wrath is, your righteous wrath. Oh God, thank you so much for letting your son Jesus suffer that wrath on the cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins and not have to suffer any of your wrath. And Father, we just pray that if there's some people this morning who are listening to all this to might realize that they're, they're just trying to be good enough, that they're not as bad as somebody else, or that they've got religion, or they've got, you know, they're trying to be pretty good. But, Lord, if they're realizing that they don't have this relationship with you, that they have not, by faith, accepted you into their lives, I just pray that right now, Father, you would lead them just to, to spend some time right now, Lord, to talk to you and say to you, God, I didn't understand all of this. God, hearing about your wrath is terrifying. But hearing about your love is unbelievable. And so, God, I I just want to let you know that right now I am choosing to step over the line of faith and to believe in your son Jesus, that he is God, that on the cross he paid for all of my sins. Lord, I pray that your son Jesus right now would come into my life, come into my heart, And be my Lord and Savior. With your head still bowed and closed. If anyone did pray that prayer, would you raise your hand? Nobody's looking but me. Everybody's eyes closed. If you prayed that, that is so exciting. Because that means you are going to spend eternity in heaven. And Father, we pray for those of us who who are believers, Lord. Help us to to, to not be uh, distracted by the things of the world, but but Lord, help us to make your priorities our priorities. Help us to live lives that put a smile on your face, to live holy and pleasing lives. And Father, you know the people in our our, our, uh, circle of influence. You know those who don't know you. And Father, I pray that you would just burden us. Put, put a heavy weight on our hearts, Lord, to, to want to go and, and find an opportunity to share with them about how they might be saved from their sins. So, Father, we love you, and we thank you for this morning. Lord, teach us. Teach us what you want us to learn from the book of Revelation. For it's in your Son, Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.